Hello, everyone, and welcome to OC Live, a weekly broadcast on blockchain, branded tokens, and token economies. We feature weekly guests to discuss the latest in blockchain uh, and the current projects that they are working on. And with us today, we have a special guest. He is a host of another podcast called The Cryptoverse. Some of you might have already seen him around. He also does uh, YouTube videos, and uh, he's also founder of Cryptoversity, uh, the one and the only uh, Chris Coney. Chris, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very, very much for having me today. Been looking forward to it. I'm excited. Yeah, so the topic of today's episode is going to be around Mimbo Wimbo and Grin and Beam. Uh, some of you might have questions around this, and, and this topic actually came up from the community. Um, uh, and uh, I think it was Scott from the community. Scott, thank you for uh, bringing this up uh, to me. So I figured, why not have somebody from the community that already discussed this topic before come on OC Live and, and share uh, insights from what this is and, and how it works. And uh, and so I found Chris, and, and Chris uh, uh, um, accepted my invitation to come on. Uh, so Chris, before we jump into Mimbo Wimbo, Grin, and Beam, uh, can you tell us about yourself and your involvement in crypto and sort of uh, um, your background and your, your lead way into when you got into crypto? Sure, I will do. I will do. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell the story slightly different because, like, when you, when when I've I've been on a lot of interviews and what I found myself doing is telling exactly the same story, exactly the same way every time. It's kind of boring. So I'm going to generate something new here. So do you know what? I think so. Fundamentally, I think everyone's got like some unique gifts, talents, and abilities. Right, which is what we're all trying to find our strengths, right? And I was thinking today, I think the first time I sort of the first sign of what that was for me was way back when I used to run my own web design and marketing agency, right? And what we used to do, like search engine optimization and online advertising and all this sort of stuff. And the problem back then was, I mean, the UK is always slightly behind the US in terms of adoption of this stuff. So this was like 2005, so online marketing webinars, and that was all rocking in the US. But British businesses were still a bit like, mm, what's this funky, magical stuff, you know, intangible? And trying to sell intangible stuff is hard, in my experience, very hard. It's like, wh what is search engine optimization? You're selling higher rankings in Google. Like, how the hell do you sell that, right? So I was thinking, and even the clients I signed up, there were so many scammers in that industry where because you know, oh, it takes like three to six months to kick in and show results and blah blah. That meant scammers could just like take your money for six months, do nothing, and then you'd never get found out for six months. And I was like, well, we're we're actually doing the work. How do we reassure our clients that the money is being spent where it is? So I came up with this. Rather than sending these stupid PDF reports that show like keywords and what they're ranking and so on, I was like, I I don't have the time to go and visit every client every month. I'm just going to burn me out. So what I came up with was this idea of basically doing a screen recording where I would spend five minutes narrating exactly what had happened in the last 30 days, what we'd done, you know, what the results were and what we we're going to do for the next month. And I've, and the clients, I, I thought if we did that and it turned out to be true, the clients would much rather just sit there, click play and listen to me gab on for five minutes than read a PDF report they had absolutely no clue about. So I started doing this for clients and they absolutely raved about it. Why I'm telling you this story is that was the first seed of me being a content creator. I didn't know it at the time, but I just naturally started gravitating in that direction, right? Using my voice, using my ability to explain things. Um, so they, my web design marketing business was fine. Maybe we were living out of it for like seven odd years, but I always freaking hated doing that, to be honest. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. Uh, and eventually just got to the point where I was like, I'm sick of this. I'm not doing this anymore. Didn't know what I was going to do instead, but drew the line at that point of like, can't do this anymore. And oddly enough, it was the the very next year, I think it was, that I ran into Bitcoin, um, which was some obscure new technology that read a bit about, dropped it, learned a bit more about it, dropped it again, learned a bit more. Eventually it was like, oh, this is, this is interesting. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to put two and two together. This skill that I'd been developing and explaining things to my clients. And I thought, well, this is complex, this Bitcoin stuff. When I start putting content out, you know, that's when I started building courses and creating content and the cryptoverse and cryptoversity were the results. So so what what year was this when when you started? Okay, so uh, if I started my web design agency 2005, um, it was about 
it was about when I was about th 29, 30 years old when, when I quit that business. So that would have been mm, 2013. Yeah. 2012. And then, and then that's when I ran into Bitcoin, bought my first Bitcoin in 2013. That's right. It was about $350. I remember. So 2013 was when I bumped into it. And then when was my first YouTube video? 2014, I think May, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so 2014, uh, pretty, pretty early on compared to, uh, 2017 when a lot of people got involved in the space. Sure. Um, so tell, tell us about the cryptoverse. Uh, some of, uh, some of the viewers might have not heard about it. Um, what, uh, can they, like, what do you cover? What can they expect to find? And sure. sort of when did you go like full time into, into, um, explaining, uh, crypto and blockchain? Sure. Sure. So the crypto verse. Um, the tagline is your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. But I mean, you can get that almost anywhere on YouTube. So what I do is I bring my moral, ethical and philosophical interpretation to cryptocurrency events, because that's that's me. And this is what I found kind of challenging about being a content creator. A lot of the rules that I was using, a lot of the philosophies about how, how to run a business don't really work the same when you becomes a content creator. Because I was used to like creating products and services and then selling them to clients, which can, you know, had nothing to do with me per se. Um, but when it came to content creation, it very much is about the the content creator's point of view and the unique distinctions that we can make. Because that's really what people are coming for. They can read the Coindesk articles, they can read the Coin Telegraph articles, <clears throat> and there are certain content creators that don't actually add any value other than just sharing the news. I'm like, well, let people read the news themselves. Like, there's no, there was, there was no value added onto the article, right? So for I, this is just my business schooling. I've got, I've got to add value somehow. How do I share the news, but then add something onto that that wasn't there before? And that's where I came up with, you know adding my moral, ethical, and philosophical interpretation. So this happened, what does it mean from a moral, ethical, and philosophical point of view? And that's where I'm adding value to the news. Because otherwise, if I'm not, shouldn't be watching my videos, right? Great, definitely. And I definitely think people look for that, like like you said, that extra commentary, extra value. Like you, okay. you've you done the, the research, you've, uh, like you're in the space, uh, and you know a lot about these different companies and these different uh, technologies so mm -hmm. like you you know a, a, a different perspective uh, from, from the average person absolutely absolutely I also I also had expertise prior to coming into crypto so I traded Forex uh, I'd run a marketing business and I'd run well I'd run a business as well so I had all of that past experience that I was bringing to crypto and one of the things I used to do in my um, episodes of the cryptoverse was i used to go mental about the terrible marketing and branding in the crypto space I even do it now i actually got a press release through this morning from some some cryptocurrency or other that's launching and they're like oh let me know is this from a pr company and they're like yeah we want you to interview the people blah 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 but let us know what you think what is i what did i reply let me get my reply out here because i'm still doing it because i look at the world through that lens because I, I, I'm, I'm an explainer that's what i do and to me, that's probably why I went to marketing, because marketing is about having a product or service that's a solution for someone's problem. And the process of selling, if you like, or marketing is the process of explaining it to the prospective customer. So, hey, Mr. Prospective customer, I see you have this problem, right? And we have this product or service, and here is how it solves your problem effectively for a brilliant price. So to me, that marketing and selling is literally explaining it like morally and ethically to people who can benefit from it, right? So when uh, when this when this PR agency said like find attached more information, if you have any questions, please get in touch. And I just basically replied saying uh, that pitch needs work. What's the compelling problem that's being solved? Is that really a problem? How big is that problem? How do we know it's a problem? What is the cost of the problem if it's left unsolved? Right? They are they're genuinely questions I need answering before I even consider covering this on the show because it was just a PR bump. Otherwise, I'm like, 
My audience doesn't care, right? Why should you want the exposure? Great, of course you want the exposure. Everyone wants the exposure, but I, my my accountability is to my audience, right? I have to provide value to them. So you need to answer those questions, otherwise you ain't getting on the show. So I'm kind of, because I was just terrible marketing. That's what gets my back up about it. So anyway, maybe that's a slight diversion, sorry. Okay, yeah, that, that's uh, <laughs> a slight like look into into uh, marketing and PR in crypto, and, and you sort of sure. get that a lot, especially as a as a creator. So, uh, sort of just a, a copied press release and mm. an email asking you to interview or, or release uh, a review on it. But we were talking about the show that there's a lot of empty content out there, um, and, mm. and sort of that like sometimes you get a, a press release from a like a well-known PR agency and it's just empty content. Right. And sure. I'm wondering how, how did they respond to, to the, to your questions? Uh, that was only today. So I didn't reply to oh. it, but I mean, isn't that the number one criticism though, right? People say, why isn't the crypto space growing? Well, cause it's complex and everyone says like, Oh, education is the solution. Education is a solution. Education is a solution. And that's what we're doing. Right. Um, and you shouldn't need education. If these companies could explain themselves properly, that's what's getting, that's what's annoying me. I shouldn't have a job as a content creator, right? If if all the crypto projects were good at articulating what the hell they were doing, well, there wouldn't be an ed education gap, but of course there is. So that's what content creators are doing here. Great. And now uh, we'll, we'll dive into Mimble sure. Wimble. Um, in, uh, I'll, uh, after the video, I'll add this time mark uh, in the video, uh, like when the discussion about Mimble it, Wimble yeah. starts. Uh, <laughs> Those of you that want to go straight into it. So Mimblewimble has, you know, it recently uh, popped up because of Grin and Beam uh, this past January. But it's something that's been around. Uh, it's not something that's new. It's something that's been around since 2016. Uh, mm -hmm. Other blockchain projects have looked at it as a possible solution for scaling. Uh, so first, well, we'll just answer the question. What is Mimblewimble? Sure. So Mimblewimble is a protocol. Um, I sh I shared um, when I originally covered the grin when it when it launched, I found this presentation. I think it was from a Blockstream employee who did a presentation on Mimblewimble as a concept, like 2015 or something. So it was it was a, it was a theoretical protocol technology for bringing privacy to Bitcoin originally, and also making the the whole technology of storing like transactions in the blockchain much lighter because there's all this talk about, well, you know, Bitcoin's only 10 years old and the blockchain's already 200 gigabytes. And that's, so that's when it's doing three transactions a second. What, what happens when we get to a thousand transactions a second is going to be enormous, right? So that's um, the types of problems that Mimblewimble was looking to solve. Bitcoin isn't private at all, right? Because if I if I mine one Bitcoin and then I spend 0 0.5 Bitcoin, you can't you can't spend half a Bitcoin. If I send it to you, I have to send the whole Bitcoin and then half of the Bitcoin goes to your wallet address and the other half comes back to me as change. So I actually send the entire one Bitcoin out, but I send half of it back to myself and half of it to you because you have to spend the entire output in a Bitcoin transaction. So that means that you get this daisy chain where you can actually follow the original one Bitcoin that I had. You can follow the chain back and then see what I spend it on next and next and next and the person you sent it to and the whole thing's auditable. So yeah, Bitcoin's not private. It just isn't. So, and that's because of one of its positive traits, which is it's, a, it's an open public blockchain that can be audited by anybody. That's the beauty of it, right? You don't have to phone up the other person on the other end said, did you get the, the wire transfer to your bank? No, you don't need to know that. You just look it up on blockchain.info. You can see it. It arrived provably. You don't need to ask the person, right? And if they complain, you go, don't give me that. It's right there on the blockchain, right? Confirm six confirmations. So what is a good trait about Bitcoin is also a bad trait, you know? Yeah. So, so Memo Wemble was uh, originally designed for, for Bitcoin and like keeping Bitcoin in mind. And, and I guess, yeah, this goes back to understanding how Bitcoin works uh, yeah. and how yeah. if somebody has your public address, it's, they can check where you sent all your Bitcoin. That's right. um, That's so let's, right. let's go through uh, like who created Memo Wimble. Uh, so there's a white paper released in 2016, August of 2016. Uh, can you tell us about the creator? 
Well, anonymous creator, because you know, like Mimble Wimble, the is is a concept from Harry Potter, which is a like a a tongue tying curse. So there are there are a number of little nods to Harry Potter in in this whole space. So Tom Elvis, uh, what is it, Jude Judasaur, Judasaur yeah. which is um, which is actually Voldemort's human name in the Harry Potter films. So uh, that's that's another way that the creator remained anonymous. Um, and it, it was originally for for Bitcoin, but it hasn't been implemented on Bitcoin. It's like even Satoshi said that once Bitcoin reached z version like zero point one. Um, its fundamental design was fixed. So that's probably why it hasn't been implemented on Bitcoin because Bitcoin's in motion. And to change something so fundamental uh, as this would, would just be now and impossible. Now, some people like anonymous creators and some people don't. Um, but in this case, the at least the author of the original protocol, which was a white paper, uh, remains anonymous to this day. So now it's a case of building implementations for Nimble Wimble, one of which we know is Grin, and one of which we know is Beam. Great, yeah. So, so it was originally meant for for Bitcoin. Uh, is this something that can still be implemented into a bit into bit the Bitcoin blockchain? Uh, is this something that would be done with a hard fork? I don't. I don't think. I don't see it happening. To be honest, not not as a not as like a. Well, check this out. I was looking on the Beam Medium blog, and on the seventh of February. They published this thing that says the Litecoin Foundation and Beam cooperation has been announced. So what they're doing is the Beam team, excuse the, excuse the rhyme, the Beam team are going to work with the Litecoin Foundation to see how they can link the two networks together, which would basically allow a Mimble Wimble variant of Litecoin to be just sort of swapped across chain. Well, essentially, without changing the Litecoin technology too much, it would bring the Mimble Wimble technology to Litecoin, right? And you know, if this is this is almost like a cliche now. People say, oh, you know, Litecoin, that's great, but it's just the test net for Bitcoin. Mm, don't, I don't really buy that, to be honest. Because there's less at stake on Litecoin, it can do stuff like this. But I just don't, I just don't see it happening on Bitcoin. So if, if people want a private Mimble Wimble type Bitcoin, this Litecoin Beam collaboration sounds like the way to go. And once we've got that, I don't think we need to implement it on Bitcoin. And I just don't see it happen on Bitcoin anyway, because it's just there's just too much at stake. It's too complex. Just don't think it'll there's something that'll happen. Good. And uh and yeah, that, that's interesting. It's something that can be implemented in, in other coins. And mm -hmm. uh, I haven't seen that post about Litecoin. Um so let, let's cover a few of the the basics that uh we breezed through, which was scalability. Uh so there's a lot of scalability solutions out there, um, like plasma. Um, so how does Mimble Wimble compare to others in the way that it works? Um, and, and you, you were mentioning the block size. So I, I think uh, let's, let's discuss like the block size and, and how a lot lightweight blockchain uh, scales better. Yes. So back to that blockchain bloat, as it's called, because you have to store everything, right? From, from the very first transaction, the Genesis block, Everything or every movement of every coin, you know, in every moment since then has been stored and has to be stored forever. So, you know, if we do three to five transactions a second on Bitcoin, well, every second, that's five more transactions of data that has to be stored forever. Like one second, five new bits of data that has to be stored forever. Five, one more second, another five, right? Forever. And as long as scaling, sorry, storage technology scales faster than that, we're okay. But there are other there were other implications like bandwidth and so on and so forth. So with Grin, um, from a user's point of view anyway, all you really care about is the current state of account balances, which is which is a fundamental difference in the way that Mimblewimble handles this stuff. So the way you know what everyone's account balance is on Bitcoin is you look up the blockchain, the state it's in now, and how you know everyone has that account balance is you just go back to where they got it from. So if I have 10 Bitcoin now in, in, a, in a particular address, I can prove that because you go back and say, well, these 10 people each sent me one Bitcoin each. Well, where did they get it from? They each got it from someone else. And eventually you go back to the Bitcoin was mined at some point, which means it went from not existing 
to existing. So great. That's the end point for when the Bitcoin was created and then it flowed from one address to another. But that's why you have to store all that stuff, right? Well, with Mimblewimble, really because, because of the way that the transactions are formatted, they're much simpler. All we really care about is what's everyone's account balance now, right? And that's that's all we have to store. Great, this is brilliant. Because it means that the size of a Mimblewimble blockchain, say Grin or, or Beam, the size of it, is not based on how many transactions have happened so far, like 10 years of Bitcoin transactions. It's not based on that. It's actually based on how many how many users we have. Because we only have to store like the current state, if there are a million users or a million accounts, we only have to store the balances of those million accounts, not the history of those millions of accounts, right? So that's a one big difference between uh, how Bitcoin stores data and how these Mimblewimble blockchains store data. It's a lot lighter. Yeah, definitely a different approach from uh, something that we've seen last year or two years ago with Bitcoin Cash, uh, which what they mm -hmm. did was just increase the block, and that just the block size would just would increase the um, the size uh, right. uh, of the blockchain to or to... Bitcoin SV, which actually they've mined the world's biggest block on a public network, which is sixty four megabytes. Because they're going for like crazy, outrageous, massive on-chain scaling with enormous blocks, um, and that's what Craig Wright's always talking about. Like, look, if you can't afford to spend twenty thousand dollars on this special, you know, <laughs> special computer that can handle these massive blocks and massive storage, then you shouldn't you shouldn't be in in the space. Whereas the Bitcoin crew is more like, no, no, keep keep the transactions small, keep the blocks small, so that the most number of people can be a node on the network so they're very different philosophical points of view yeah that de definitely that's what i was gonna get to uh yeah. say it was Sorry. um oh, that that yeah it, it, it makes it easier to onboard for anybody to to come on board with a lighter uh, sure. uh blockchain um it it so, so i guess wrapping up with privacy we already discussed privacy a little bit um so i guess some of the techniques are called coin join which is uh basically what you discussed uh, so it it sort of hides data, it, it obscures data, so that you can't go back and, and track um, where the Bitcoin was transferred from. Uh, yeah. CoinJoin is slightly different. CoinJoin is a mixing system. So CoinJoin is a privacy solution for Bitcoin. So uh, I have the Wasabi wallet on my computer. It's a desktop wallet. It's brilliant. It's dead simple. You send your Bitcoin to it, and you click mix, and it coin joins it. Right. So it basically takes everyone's hundred dollar bills and sticks them on the table, messes them all up, right? And then gives them all back. But you don't know if you got the original hundred dollar bill or not, but nobody cares, right? But then that means if say, I don't know, the, the hundred dollar bill I get back, oh, there's traces of cocaine on there. You can't get me for that. It could have been one of anybody's, right? Don't know where that came from. Then you know, so so there's no there's no history to the coin anymore. You don't know whose is whose. So that's that's coin join, dash uses coin join and so on. The reason that Mimble Wimble blockchains are private is because the transaction history, the amounts, aren't stored on chain, right? The, the fundamental way that Mimblewimble transactions work is that you don't you don't broadcast it to everybody, right? Two individual wallets online connect to each other directly and basically transact in private, rather than telling everybody, "Hey, I'm sending one Bitcoin to my friend to this address," right? And then everybody knows about it in Mimblewimble. Only the sender and the receiver know about it, and you just submit the results. To say, look, just to make sure, the only reason you have to submit the results to everybody else is to prove you didn't create any new currency in private, right? If I have one grin and I'm sending one grin, doesn't matter how many times that happens in private, as long as it was only one grin that I had, and you know, there's only a net one grin at the end of all that transacting. So that's really where where the privacy comes from. The information isn't stored, so privacy by default. Great. So so. Um, Mimblewimble seems like a seems like a good protocol. Uh, it has privacy. It's scalable. Are there many? Are there like any big limitations to it? Um, I, I heard uh, there's some talk about the possibility of of negative outputs, uh, which, like you said, that's that would mean uh, creating a new coin. Um, so, uh, are there many limitations to to Mimblewimble? It's still a blockchain, so you know it's still got the restrictions thereof such as transaction throughput you know um i think i was talking about eos the other day and and how any blockchain that increases its transactions per second 
is automatically requiring more bandwidth and more storage. So if you're a blockchain, that's a fundamental problem you inherit. So I think even, even Beam, when I was looking today, they've already put out a little white paper about, where is this? Yeah, the Beam Lightning Network Positioning Paper, they're calling it. Um, and they say Lightning Network, yeah, it's already got a 600 Bitcoin capacity, even though it's new and blah, blah, blah. But the fact that Beam is a is a still a blockchain inherits some of the problems inherent therein. So they're starting to look at Lightning Network as well. But that's that's starting to really that's really starting to cook my noodle because then I have to get my head around. Okay, so the Mimblewimble system works like this. Now, if you add the Lightning Network on top of that, so that when you're opening Lightning channels, you're opening them as Mimblewimble transactions instead of on-chain Bitcoin transactions. So I'm, I'm still like adding those two concepts together. I hadn't linked them before, but it's getting more and more complex as these technologies are stacked onto each other. But that's that's what they're already thinking about how to scale Mimblewimble blockchains with things like Lightning. So that's that's in the works. Great. That that's that's pretty pretty interesting to see. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, um, like not news, but a lot of uh, like there's been the the Lightning um, like sending of transactions on Twitter recently. Uh, where people nominated people to to use Lightning, and, and it's great to see that happening. Um, sure. So I, I think we covered most of Mimblewimble. Let me know if I, I missed anything. Um, but I guess we, we can now move into Grin and Beam. Um, sure. So a, a common question is, if Mimblewimble is a, a protocol for Bitcoin, uh, then what is Grin and Beam? Okay, sure. So we started out by saying that Mimblewimble was a protocol, right? In the same way that Lightning is a protocol, so it's just a it's just a you know a theoretical technology on on a scientific paper, and anybody could then take that scientific concept and apply it. So Lightning is applied on Bitcoin, it's applied on Litecoin, it's applied on Decred, you know, it's applied on any compatible blockchain that chooses to implement it. So those are specific implementations of lightning so if mimblewimble is similar it's a protocol um it can be implemented on any compatible blockchain or a brand new one so grin and beam are specific networks that have been launched from scratch using mimblewimble as the fundamental like data structure you know distinct from how bitcoin works so in uh, really the credit the only real the only real way to do it in the, in the first instance is to launch a brand new network, right? For the first, for Mimblewimble to be used first by a pre-existing blockchain, that's just not wise, right? It's better to just launch a brand new network, see how it works in the wild, and then and then work with it from there. So Grin and Beam are specific examples, two different networks that use Mimblewimble um, and uh, go coming at it from slightly different angles, which we can talk about if you want. Yeah, and uh, and I guess uh, I'll I'll pull up a table here to sort of discuss those different angles of these two different, uh, not really companies, but but uh, these two different approaches to to implementing sure. Mimblewimble into a new um, a new blockchain. Let's see. Well, you know, I made a funny distinction. I, I meant to say it at the beginning of this sort of interview, but it occurred to me. It only occurred to me when we started talking which is that grin is like a big smile, right? And beam, sometimes sometimes people say, oh, you're beaming, I had a big beaming smile. I don't know if that's where the name came from, but if you look at the grin logo, it's a, it's a, like an emoji with a big smile on its face. Um, and I wonder if beam is like a be beaming smile. That's just my wacky mind going crazy, but there you go. Look, see the M MW in the eyes, mimble wimple. Um, so I don't know if I don't know if that's where beam came from as well, like beaming smile. But anyway, it's uh, moving swiftly on. <laughs> yeah. So so uh, two different approaches, and this is the beam website, uh, as you pointed out, the M and W member Wimble. Um, and I found this table from a, another creator. Let me pull that up, and it goes over the differences between mm -hmm. um, beam and grin. Um, and yeah. So so what the biggest the first biggest difference is that. Grin is completely anonymous, uh, whereas Beam is a public, public, publicly known company. It is, it is. I mean, that, I would say that is the biggest distinction um, to make: is that Beam is 
I would almost call it a for-profit project, right? There was a company that started, they had some private investment, they spent that money hiring developers to develop the, the Beam network, and it's been launched, right? So now, as you can see from the founder's reward thing there, the 20% of all block rewards on Beam, they they go to the um, the Beam company for five years. And they're then, they're then taking those rewards and paying back their original investors, giving them a return on investment, um, paying developers and that kind of thing. So it is it is very much been started like a business. You know, they got private investment, developed a product, launched it, and now they're they're getting their return on that investment and funding it ongoing through a block reward. So I see Beam as like the Microsoft Windows, you know, the for-profit software project. And you got Grin, which is very much a Linux approach, right? It's entirely community driven, no profit incentive really whatsoever. It's funded entirely by donations, as far as I can tell. Uh, completely open source, and you know, more the Linux versus Windows type of thing. So that's those are the real big distinctions there. Now, bit dangerous, I think, because um, it could just fall straight flat on its face if 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 the community doesn't fund it, if the community doesn't donate, uh, it's just going to collapse, right? Which is very uncertain in my view. At least Beam whether you like the commerciality of it or not, at least they're funded and you know where the money's coming from and you know someone or some company has an incentive to keep it going, at least for five years anyway. Yeah, that, definitely. And I think that's one of the things that I'm I'm interested to see how it plays out. Because, mm. uh, you know, if, if there's no funding, then there's no incentive to further yeah. develop. Um, sure. And yeah, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk around funding in, in several different projects. Um, especially for core developers, um, yeah. but yeah, very, very, very. Just want to see how that plays out, and and you never know. Maybe the community uh, uh, does fund Grin. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion around people uh, preferring Grin over Beam, and I think that that might be because they they like that it's anonymous, that it's uh, uh, mm -hmm. that there is no reward going to a central team. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, Interesting to see how that plays out. Um, sure. I guess the, the next thing I think here is uh, the inflation. So, so are these coins meant to be used as as uh, currencies? Yes, absolutely. The way I understand it is these projects are specifically targeting um, payment networks, right? Um, I I actually gave credit to Andreas Antonopoulos in my original Grin introduction video. So, is I think about Bitcoin in the center here. And then Ethereum was like, well, Bitcoin's too restrictive. It has a scripting language. It can do certain kind of clever stuff, but we want um we want to build apps. So Ethereum went this way, up the complexity scale and said, right, let's create a general purpose programming language that, you know, a, a virtual machine that can actually make complex applications that can do complex things and run loops and, and all kinds of typical programming type things so that when more complex more functional more features um you know more possibility grin went and beam have gone the other way they've actually gone past bitcoin past it in terms of simplicity and more simple than bitcoin stripped out a lot of stuff you know stri stripped out the scripting language and said right what do we need to make a private cryptocurrency that people pay each other with that's super lightweight super private and super fast and that's the design decision that was made. So that's a long answer to the question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and and I think they specifically, uh, uh, you know, added that inflation and and, and work towards simplicity and, and try to make this uh, not not try to do what happened with Bitcoin, uh, which is with Bitcoin. Uh, it I guess initially uh, everybody's saying as a currency, and and it's come to become a, a store of value. Not many people are using it as a currency as as something you would use on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's something that these two uh, coins are trying to uh, trying to cover. Sure. I mean, as a crypto investor myself, that's one of the things I look for is like, does the coin know what it is? And I'm almost treating like a person, but Bitcoin doesn't know what it is. And, 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 and everyone's using it for different reasons. Some, when people use it as a store of value, it is a store of value. 
but people use it as a currency, it is. But people use it as a commodity, it isn't. This is the problem the regulators are having. It, it's a chameleon. Like Depending on how you use it, it is that thing. It is a commodity in that moment, or it is a currency. And I can go from using Bitcoin as a store of value to using it as a commodity to using it as a, eh, you know, so using it anything like that. So if, if, if a, and this is the benefit of having a company behind a project is because someone declares this is what it's for, right? Um, and Grin and Beam don't have that problem. They've both been declared and by their very designs have been declared as cryptocurrencies for payments. Once you've decided that, it makes a lot of the development decisions easier because you can then sort all of the suggestions. Does this make it a better, more private cryptocurrency for payments? If yes, let's consider it. If no, discard it. Problem with Bitcoin is everyone's trying to throw stuff on it. Bitcoin Cash is now doing things like, oh, let's let's build a social network on Bitcoin Cash. I'm like, what? Wasn't it Bitcoin Cash? That was the whole reason I used to be a fan of it. I'm quite lost interest in it now. What the hell are you doing? Right, it's Bitcoin Cash. You're building apps and smart contracts. That, what you completely lost its way. It doesn't know what it is anymore. So anyway, that's that. But at least Beam and Grin do know what they are. Yeah, and and going back to the privacy factor of a cryptocurrency. So these are meant to be cryptocurrencies to be spent to be uh, yeah. used to buy things. Uh, but there are tons of other cryptocurrencies out there, uh, and there are a handful that try to address privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of the popular ones are Monero mm -hmm. uh, and Zcash. Um, so how do these compare? How does Grin and Beam compare to something like Monero and Zcash? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Monero and Zcash are much closer to uh, a Bitcoin blockchain design in terms of like not public because they're encrypted, but you still store all the information. It's just encrypted. Whereas with, with Beam and Grin, they're designed to have much less you know storage burden. So... Privacy is actually just built into the very design of how Mimblewimble works. And in fact, I don't even know if, I mean, Beam of a, a building in, I was listening to the, the CEO of the Beam company talk about how the Beam network and transactions are private by default. And there's going to be a way to, um, to almost make them unprivate for the benefit of like auditing from the government or taxes or whatever else, right? So that's similar to Monero, because Monero has this thing called a view key, which you could give to a government authority that would allow them, them to decrypt all your transactions, right? Uh, but you'd have to provide them with that key. But it's, it's difficult to answer that question without spending like an hour talking about the differences. But I'll, the, the, short, the short version is that Zcash and Monero, they're much closer to Bitcoin's design, and therefore they have these blockchain bloat problems and uh, scaling problems and so on, whereas Beam and Grin are not are designed differently, so that doesn't happen. One thing that is similar about Zcash is, and actually, the Beam founder said this is where he got the idea. Uh, Zcash was launched with um, a percentage of all the block rewards going to fund development, right? Um, and that's how Beam now funds itself, like it's like getting a return on investment for the investors. So they looked at Zcash and thought, oh, using some of the block reward to, to pay ourselves, we'll use that model. So that's a similarity. Great, definitely. Uh, yeah, that's something that's been used by, by many blockchain teams is to have a, a block reward sent back. Um, going back to, to the the type of mechanism for privacy, um, mm. does, does Monero use CoinJoin? No. Monero uses um, ring signatures, which again is... It's, 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 I'm not going to, I'm going to get murdered by the Monero community if I'm not careful with my words here. But the difference with these Mimblewimble chains is they're not, they're not, they're not adding privacy later, right? It's not like CoinJoin where Bitcoin isn't private and then you mix the coins to create the privacy. Grin and Beam, they're just privates, right? You can't, you have to do something to make them not private. Right? That's what the Beam founder was talking about. So if you just use Grin and Beam, out of the box, privacy just is, right? Whereas a Monero does have privacy built into the way it works, but it's still doing clever things to sort of make it private, to make the transactions private, which they wouldn't be if you just use straight plain vanilla blockchain transactions, right? So Monero does, does a version of that thing where you put all the $100 bills in the middle, mix them up so that all the inputs and outputs is, 
impossible to know whose is whose, right? So if someone ends up spending money on something the government doesn't agree with, you, you couldn't figure out who that was. You know, it was one of these eight people and it was one of these eight payments, but you don't know which one's which. Um, Grin and Beam just don't have that information. It's just not stored anywhere. So that's the big difference. Good, and, and I think we, we covered most of uh, the differences um, between Grin and Beam and, and Grin and Beam and these other uh, privacy coins. Um, and sort of at the beginning, we were talking about how uh, people watch content creators for sort of a, a their perspective on it. And I wanted to hear your perspective on on uh, Beam and Grin. Uh, uh, I guess th there's people that side with Beam and people that side with Grin. Um, so where do you see the future of these coins? Do you think they're likely to succeed? Um, and, and what will it take for, for user adoption? Mm -hmm. Yes. What will it take for user adoption? <clears throat> Interesting. Do, do you think people trust these coins that they are uh, like 100% uh, private in that there will never be a way to, for somebody to find a way to audit you? That is the case as far as I can tell. I mean, the only way to, to know that for absolute certainty would be to have extremely deep cryptographic expertise, which you know most of us don't have, so we, you're trusting it in that regard. Um, so your question was like, what's it going to take to get them adopted? Well, normal stuff like um, how many exchanges are they listed on? How easy is it to use? Check this out. I don't think Grin right now has a a wallet you can download with a graphical user interface. Beam does. I tested it today. I downloaded the Beam wallet. Looks pretty good, right? It's got colored buttons and stuff like this. It took me five minutes to get up and running, right? That includes creating a brand new wallet, writing down a recovery phrase, setting a password, syncing the blockchain, which took like a minute, and boom, there I was. And then I went on to CoinMarketCap, looked at you know where they where are they trading, and interestingly. Grin's 24-hour trading volume is $16 million versus Beam's $6 million. So that's interesting. Traders seem to like trading Grin more than they like trading Beam. Very interesting. Uh, also, Grin is on a lot more exchanges. There are 38 markets trading uh, Grin and 10 markets trading Beam. So I actually wanted to test it out. So I went on to Hotbit, which is an exchange I've never used before, and uh, bought some Beam with Ether. And I wanted to take it out, withdraw it, just to see how fast the transaction was. Unfortunately, Hotbit don't allow you to withdraw transactions until your account is 24 hours old. So I'm going to have to do it tomorrow. But yeah, the only experience of uh, getting up and running with Beam was super. So that's the kind of thing it's gonna, that's going to boost adoption. I mean, the people that care about a lot of the stuff we're talking about are the hardcore cryptocurrency and blockchain enthusiasts. When it comes to mass adoption, people just want it to work. Right, that's just get real. People just want it to work. And right now, if you gave them the choice between the two, they would choose Beam because you could just download a wallet and it looks like a any other a wallet application. It's super easy. It's just and you'll never think about Grin again. And that's not just my point of view. I'm not saying I'm a big Beam fan. I'm just looking at it objectively, saying mass adoption, mass mass users don't care about this, that, and the other. They just want it to work. They want something that's fast. They just want something that's easy to use something that's private, and if Beam gives them that, and you can get set up in five minutes, that's the one they're going to use. So it's uh, it's on Grin to catch up. Great. So so it's sort of the, the same answer to any blockchain adoption issue, which is, um, does it work for the average user? Uh, exactly. You know, it has to be, you know, built, you know, grandma-proof, kit-proof. Grandma. Uh, that's it. Totally it. And uh, yeah, I think I think that's uh, a, a common theme here in in, in crypto. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll we'll see how very, it. Very early days, though. I mean, these blockchains have already launched, so give them a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may, maybe not that proof yet, but but yeah, yeah um, we'll we'll see. I'm you know I'm curious to see how how Grin plays out. Um, sure. And yeah, I think that's just that funding piece is the one that worries me the most. Just that funding piece, you know, who is going to fund it and why? I uh, don't know. Unless you buy like a billion dollars worth of Grin, then you've got an incentive to fund development. But I don't know. Yeah, and and I think that's also an issue in other um, in other projects that are set up that way. Um, and even like yeah. if you're an Ethereum user, do you 
yourself donate to the Ethereum Foundation to further develop Ethereum? I wonder. Um, I do wonder. And, yeah, I actually do. I wouldn't. I wouldn't, I do wonder. I wonder if they publish that. They should do. They should publish how many donations they're getting, because my understanding of the Ethereum Foundation right now is they're still they're still living off of the ICO money. Yeah, and that's that's also you know sort of a tangent here, but that's also a discussion that's been going on with uh, like developers and and something that's been brought up. You know, what if they were to run out of funding? Um, and not not that you know the whole Ethereum is going to stop uh, developing, but, well, no. I mean, but like, the the thing with I'm just drawing a quick diagram here. The thing with that is that I wouldn't worry about Ethereum so much because. I'm just me finish drawing this real quick diagram here. So, if if Ethereum is in the middle there, right, and all of those circles around it are the companies and applications and so on that rely on it, there's so much, so many other companies and organizations that now rely on Ethereum succeeding. If the funding dried up, they would all have an incentive to donate to the Ethereum Foundation, or their entire their entire network, their business is based on collapses. So it's fine. They're not going to let that happen, right? Coinbase will stick some money in. Everyone will stick a bit of money in, right? But they won't until they have to. So that's just my view. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was sort of my my thought process too. Is the 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 DApps that are being built or the companies mm-hmm. building on Ethereum? Uh, they sort of have this like if Ethereum were to need funding, it's sort of like a, a moral to to give to the foundation that you're sure. you're uh, building on. They should be like they should be tithing to the Ethereum Foundation just to protect their own interests. I mean, it's, your whole business is based on the Ethereum network evolving, being secure, and the developers doing their job. And thank God, if you're not contributing to that, well, you know, you're taking a risk. You know, great. And um, yeah, so for for the live viewers that are watching this, uh, thank you so much for for tuning in. Hope you guys learned about uh, Mimblewimble, Grim. Um, and uh, and beam is there is there anything else we should cover? I think no, I am pretty happy with that. Um, I don't think we only just scratched the surface, but this is what I was saying about this. There's so much to know that we could we could just we could be on for a, a, you know hours talking about just this one topic. Yeah, and and uh, there's there's sort of a um, I, I hear feedback from podcasts a lot is that s- some of the podcasts are very long and, and people don't want to. Okay listen to the whole thing we're, we're more than welcome to talk about it but uh for the viewers that are like just want to get the info there's a recap of this podcast posted on medium uh and it'll just highlight the straight context of uh what is memble wimble what is grin what is beam maybe i should have mentioned that in the beginning but yeah we'll have that posted on medium um and uh chris where can where can viewers uh find you best place to go is the cryptoverse.show and you'll be able to find your way from there to my YouTube channel, social networks, and also my online school, where you can take a bunch of courses on how to be a better crypto investor. Great, and uh, I'll link those down in the description below. Uh, be sure to, you know, if you like today's episode, uh, it's with uh, Chris on the show. Uh, you're, you're gonna love his content. Um, and this is actually where where uh, I found him discussing Grin and uh, Mimble Wimble, and uh, and I thought he made a great, he would make a, a great explainer which is what uh, we had him on today. Uh, but yeah, so for the viewers, be sure to subscribe to Chris's content. I'll link down his channels uh, down in the description below. Um, other than that, we have uh, weekly guests. For those of you that are new to this podcast, uh, we host weekly live shows. Uh, next week, we're going to have somebody from uh, Ethereum Name Service come on and discuss ENS and how you can uh, set up your own Ethereum address with uh, making it simpler, uh, say, with your name. To say like jose.eth instead of that long uh, uh, key. And we can have that uh, on next week. And yeah, Chris, thanks so much for joining us on OST Live. You're very welcome. Very much appreciate it. And I've enjoyed it.